Welcome to our podcast on the ground up, where we interview startup founders exploring their journeys, their challenges, successes, and lessons learned. We hope you'll be inspired in discovering what it takes to build a thriving startup. I'm your host, Jake here in Villarreal, and excited to have with us today, Adam Pittenger, founder of Move, a startup that's raised $15 million in funding, helps automate the move process for real estate companies and their residents. Before we dive in, give us a little bit of your background and how you got into technology. Yeah, so um, I moved to New York out of uh, at a, at a school after graduating, and I joined a startup as a client success manager. Actually, we were um, building some of the first social recruiting software. It's part of a really small team uh, working directly with our clients, and I really discovered what product management product management was back then, which is this wonderful sort of mix of art and science. It was uh, sort of the perfect blend for me where. I was in front of our clients. These are massive companies. We're talking um, IBM, eBay, Goldman Sachs, Google, working directly with them on, on their challenges and, and you know, notably around recruiting. Um, and then I'd be sitting next to our product and engineering teams, quickly give them feedback, ideas, thoughts, and just worked with them to sort of create solutions that we would then bring to our clients, drive results. And it was this wonderful feedback loop. So I was sort of intoxicated by the process and fell in love with product management, which has really fueled my my career in technology since then. That's great. You know, they say proximity oftentimes dictates the work you do. If you live in the Midwest in Detroit, maybe you get into the automotive sector. Um, you got into it, it looks like on the East Coast in New York. I worked at Oracle in New York. There's lots of technology innovation in really hub cities. Talk to me about the proximity of kind of how you started and launched your startup today moved. Anybody in particular influenced that decision? Walk me through how that started. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think you nailed it. The proximity and, and sort of what's happening in your life really fueled that decision for me and, and sort of the, the path I've taken to get where we are today. So that startup I referenced earlier, we, uh, <clears throat> we built that up over a couple of years and then we sold it to Oracle. I stayed on at Oracle for a year and jumped to another startup, which coincided with, I was doing my fourth move in, in four years, all in Manhattan. So I was in this sort of renter cycle wow. of every 12 months, uh, I was moving from apartment to apartment and it was just a very broken process. Uh, and I saw not only the troubles I had myself, but my parents were going through a move. My girlfriend at the time was going through a move and it was just this really painful and stressful experience with no technology, no automation, no hospitality involved in you do any research, it's a top three most stressful life event. Why is that, right? So <clears throat> I think a combination of my personal experiences, those personal relationships, and having some really solid mentors uh, and sort of support and advisement around me, where I was like, I'm gonna quit my job and start a company. Uh, I had a lot of uh, really helpful folks there to sort of walk me through that, think through all the different uh, scenarios and ultimately took the plunge and, and decided to uh, kind of work on solving the problem I was having myself. Yeah, it's funny you say that. When I moved to New York, you know, at, with Oracle from San Francisco to Oracle, they got me a real estate agent that walked me around from a car, apartment to apartment. And as I was walking through Central Park, I was really happy with that experience in general. I happened to see my college roommate running down the Central Park that I didn't even know lived in New York at the time. And it was just, a, it was a funny moment that I remember, you know, 20 years later, but the experience of, you know, working and relocating is, is painful and it's costly. And ultimately you end up um, sometimes just settling for what you get. And uh, I think anything that can help improve that experience, maybe reduce your cost in the process would be great, but I'm really excited to kind of learn about your company where you took it from there. So that's kind of the idea that inspired you to start it. As a founder, you have to do a lot of things. You got to find the right engineers, build the right product, have the right idea. What were those first initial steps for you? Yeah, um, I'd probably do it differently in retrospect, but that's uh, part of the journey is, is falling down and getting back up. But the journey for me was uh, I did end up quitting my job. I remember I went to uh, a coffee shop, uh, sat down, I was alone, solo founder, and I was like, okay, what do I do now? Uh, and, and that was kind of the start of the journey. What I did was, um, for better or for worse, my the lens through which I viewed everything was 
the problem I was trying to solve and product, right? Like my brain was wired through product management, building software to solve problems. That's where my career started. And that's kind of where my headspace was at the time. Uh, and so I very luckily had a strong, uh, technical foundation in terms of product and engineering team in the company. We sold to Oracle, very close friends of mine. And so I worked with, um, a designer I had previously worked with to kind of create some in initial mock-ups, which I use from a sort of sales and fundraising perspective. Hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And then I was able to get uh, a couple engineers to give me some nights and weekend time to start building a first version of the product. Um, again, probably do things a little differently in the future, but we built an initial product um, and then ultimately leveraged that to get into an accelerator, which kind of took us to the next phase and then our seed round and sort of, uh, you know, just cascading from there. So many of the founders we talked to on this show went through accelerators, Y Combinator, Techstars. Which one did you go through? So we went through uh, an accelerator called AngelPad, um, really popular back when I went through it. They were known as like the anti Y Combinator Super small classes, 12 companies in, in our batch, non-competitive with each other. Um, they basically put you in a co-working space and tell you to sleep there for, for weeks on end. And, uh, and that was a really incredible experience for a number of, of reasons. Um, but we went through that sort of half in New York, half in San Francisco. Uh, and it was really validating to um, sort of my network and the folks that I was already talking to. Wow, this is... Um, you know, a really interesting accelerator that has bought in to what, what we're doing and what we wanted to do. And uh, it taught me a lot personally. Like I said, kind of where I started was just like building product and going. So much focus on customer discovery, learning, getting close to the customers, getting close to the problem. And it gave me sort of my initial, um, you know, education into venture capital, which was this world I was about to enter and, and work on, uh, you know, selling into, but really I had no background and no, no knowledge of. So it was, it was super helpful. I'd say on those two main things. When you get to raising capital, it's, I think for a lot of founders, the first time there's really a, not a clear understanding of how you go about it. And ultimately, you know, how, how many no's you have to hear before you get the yeses. Walk me through that a little bit with your company and how many times did you pitch to, before you really got funded and were you funded by the accelerator coming out once you graduated? Yes. Yeah, so um, before the accelerator, I brought on a little sort of like angel friends and family capital. The first check I got was, was 100K from a woman who had sold to her healthcare company, not at all in technology, but uh, just sort of entrepreneurial network around and, and sort of met her and pitched her. Her friend said, hey, I'll follow whatever she does. So I had 125K. I got to start paying some people, which was which was nice to get it going. Then the accelerator came in, they put in uh, 50K at the time. But again, I said, you know, I said earlier that sort of validated us. So a, a lot of the folks and investors I was talking to then said, okay, you know, I, I trust uh, Tomas Corte who runs AngelPad. Um, I'll put in a little bit more now. So the, the combination of before and sort of during uh, the accelerator, we were, we raised 550K all in at that point. And then you get to demo day and demo day is sort of, you know, this big pitch to investors and you run and you go try to raise your seed round. Uh, and to your question, that's really where I started to take a large amount of meetings. I think I met with around 125 investors. That's not meetings. That's different investors before we raised our seed round, before I got that first initial sort of lead check that said, okay, let's, re let's lead this round. Let's do it. And as you go through that presentation mode and just the practice of it, do you feel like you, you, you sort of improve as you go, you kind of, you start with one way of pitching and then ultimately, you know, you get better at how you're positioning the product and the platform and the company. I think you have to, um, you know, I think I'm certainly better at fundraising than I was back then, but even along that path, you're you're getting a ton of data, right? You don't have to accept it all, right? You don't have to say, hey, I believe in, you know, the feedback this investor gave me, which not all of them give you feedback. Sometimes you just get, and then you don't hear back from them. But um, I'm somebody who very much wants to keep an open mind, take that feedback in, hear it, sit with it, and then I can, you know, choose to accept it or reject it. Uh, so I think it helped us improve the company. I think it helped us help me improve the pitch and sort of my fundraising ability. 
But ultimately at that stage, it's still so early. You need to find somebody who truly has conviction and sort of these core pillars of what they're investing in, which is team and market and vision. So, um, you know, I'd say just having the, the number of at bats I did was probably the most effective thing Just keeping my head down, being persistent and, and stepping back up to the plate was equally as effective than any sort of fundraising strategy I had. I like that. The persistence I know is really important and keeping a good attitude and psychologically just knowing that there's a, there's an opportunity in the future. You just keep plugging away. Is there a book or any insightful resource that other founders might, that are looking to raise capital might learn from that you read or anything that comes to mind outside of the accelerator and just, you know, giving, getting guidance and pitching? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> venture deals. Uh, Brad Feld, you know, I think is, I think wrote that, that book is sort of a, you know, the, the basics of like what a fundraise looks like. Um, I think there's a lot in the process and sort of mechanics, which are ever evolving that um, may not be in a book, but are sort of kept up in, in, you know, blog posts and, you know, sort of, Hey, here's the strategy I went through. Although I will say a lot of what you'll see online is sort of this founder raised $60 million, 12 days with this process. Like that's the 0.001% of companies. The other ones have to go through a bit of a, a different process. So um, I'd say sort of the, the fundamentals of what goes into a venture uh, venture round would be the book venture deals. Um, but learning how to truly fundraise, I would say most of what I learned was practice getting, you know, in the arena, if you will. And uh, my network, right? Just talking to other founders, uh, those founder to founder conversations are always so meaningful because everyone else is, is going through it. Notably with folks who have, who are ahead of you, who have raised those rounds, continue to raise those rounds and build the company. They'll give you really good, honest feedback and help you um, not fine tune your pitch, but more fine tune your process, which I, I'd argue is equally important. What's the formula to really understand giving up equity and taking funds is there like a process that you learned or you go through because i know there's a lot of founders we talk to and they always ask us you know we're thinking about raising capital i'm not sure how much equity we want to give up but you know what are your thoughts and i just always like to understand from others you know what have you learned what do you think uh worked for you or maybe others that you you've you've spoken with there's sort of market benchmarks at like seed and series A um, that that you'll sort of want to anchor into in those conversations. Call it, you know, giving up 15 to 25 percent, 30 on the high end in terms of, um, you know, what that round looks like. I early on, you know, there's sort of like misconception of get the highest valuation you can. Sure, there's merit to that, but I was lucky to have somebody in my network early on tell me, Actually, you don't always want to do that. And I think we're actually seeing sort of the effects of that 2021 and uh, sort of the explosion of capital and these crazy rounds and valuations. We're seeing that, you know, the, the hurt in the market as a result of that. Um, you have to grow into your valuation, right? So there's this like balance you need to strike of, okay, the higher my valuation, the less I give up for, for this amount of capital. Um, however, I need to make sure that I'm in my next round, I'm raising at an up round. Okay. So where does my revenue need to be at that point? And am I able to get there? Otherwise you run into a whole world of hurt when you try to raise that next round and your numbers don't support it. You have to lay off or you do a down round and you restructure, you know, recap. It's, uh, it can get really messy. So you don't want to, you don't want to set it too high where, you're in trouble in that next round, or you limit your optionality as a founder where um, you need to sell the company at a, at a price that the market just simply can't support. Um, and then, you know, you put all this time and effort and your, your team's time and effort um, for an outcome that just isn't going to happen. Makes a lot of sense. Let's switch gears a little bit here. Let's talk about Move. Um, moved, walk us through the real problem you're solving. You, I, you gave us the high level but give us a use case. What's yeah. a use case of a company that's bought into your product, they're using it, and the experience that maybe the tenants get out of it and, and what that's like too? Yeah, so we started as a direct-to-consumer concierge service for moving. Like the, the easiest way to think about it is Uber for moving um, with a concierge service attached to it. 
that's really hard for a number of reasons, and I'm happy to, to touch on that. But fast forward, for those reasons, plus a really key insight we had along the way, we sort of pivoted the business to what you see on our website today. That key insight was moving isn't just hard for you and me as consumers. Moving is really hard for these properties. You have real estate on all ends of the move, and there's a property management team or a leasing team who's being charged with all the manual effort and coordination around onboarding and offboarding residents. This is very nuanced and specific per property. This could be things like reserving elevators and loading docks, uploading your renter's insurance, uploading your insurance for your moving company, um, you know, scheduling time to pick up your keys, setting up your utilities and providing proof to the property, registering your pet, paying your security deposit. There's this list of things on top of your personal to-dos for removing that the property needs you to get done as well. Uh, and we saw that with our customers. I saw that with myself, you know, personally, I was moving into a property and I, I knew these things needed to get done by virtue of, of, you know, the company I was building. And my leasing agent was like, I don't have time for this. I don't know, figure it out. And it was just like, why is there not a single dashboard that allows me to have all of my personal to do and all the property to do's. Um, and so that's really what we built. And, and, and the sort of where we hang our hat is we're providing operational efficiency for these property managers. We're taking all this time away from their team, from all that email back and forth and phone calls and texts where they're managing that process manually today. We're giving the residents a much better experience, making sure they're ready for their move before the lease begins. And then, you know, sort of a key part of our, our vision of the future is the ability for us to help these residents transact with the purchases and the products that they need during the moving experience. And that's moving companies, that's renter's insurance, that's cable and internet packages, furniture purchases, TV mounting, all these things that happen during the move, we're in a position to facilitate that. So what the experience might look like for a consumer today is I find an apartment I love, I apply, I get accepted, and then I go through move to do all those things. Purchase and upload my renter's insurance, book my move for Saturday at 8 a.m. Now I have a moving company who's gonna show up my place at 6 a.m. to make sure we're there at 8 a.m. Um, they're already insured, that's on file with the with, with the move, with the, uh, the property that I'm moving into. Um, setting up my utilities, making that really easy, getting my cable and internet hooked up on the day I move in. All those tasks you coordinate through our software, makes it really easy for the property and easy for the resident who's going through. So is the business model that you get paid by the property owner or is it paid by the consumer that uses your platform as well? Um, we're not paid by the consumer. The, the business model is B2B to C in that we are paid by the properties. So it's sort of the B2B element of what we do, uh, monthly subscription fee to you know use our software and get all the benefits I mentioned. Um, and then by virtue of doing that, residents are coming through our software. They have to use us to do the sort of operational components of moving in like the elevators and renters insurance, et cetera. And by sort of having them at this moment in time, as we're sort of this check-in aisle of the property, um, there are all these products and services they're looking for. They're you know, setting up new habits and routines and, and, you know, looking to sort of furnish their apartment and get these things set up. We really like to take the product philosophy of you have a problem. We're going to present it to you. But we're immediately going to present you with the solution. So we're going to make money as well on, doing that effectively for residents, meaning if you book a move through us, those, that moving company will pay us. If you buy renter's insurance through the platform, that renter's insurance company is going to pay furniture, cable and internet, et cetera. So we're getting paid by those vendors as well to help them acquire new customers at the perfect moment in time for a lower acquisition cost than they're getting on Google or Instagram or elsewhere. I love that. I've got a friend who is a major builder of condos and multi-tenant facilities in Silicon Valley. So I got to connect you with him at some point. I think it might make sense. And I think it's a novel idea and it's really getting some traction. I didn't know this was a, a biz dev call, Jake, but I love it. Let's, yeah, uh, just... let's, get, let's get it going. <laughs> you never know where, where, we, can, where, where we take it here. Um, in terms of the idea that you started with, you know, every company starts with a thesis, you go to market, sometimes you have to make a change or a pivot what was a major pivot for you in your journey? Yeah, it w I mean, the headline, it would be going from a direct to consumer business to a, an enterprise software sale. So, you know, we are that B2B, B2B2C model. We're building, the majority of what we build from a product perspective is consumer facing software. 
but it's consumer facing software that's activated through an enterprise sale. So that changed our whole mindset, our whole organization around, okay, how do I acquire customers as, you know, through Google, uh, through channel partnerships, um, uh, you know, through Instagram ads, you know, influencer campaigns, PR, it changed that completely to how do I get a property management company at the highest levels of their organization and in their operations department? How do I get them bought into what we're doing and what we're delivering to their teams and their residents? And that's a completely different sales and marketing strategy and, and go to market motion where we're no longer spending anything on ads. We're going to conferences. We are, you know, hiring a sales team and managing a sales team and commission structures and uh, working on, you know, complete enterprise agreements and rollout strategies, and implementation. This isn't, hey, come to move.com and book your move. This is, hey, we're going to completely change the way in which your 50,000 unit real estate portfolio onboards and offboards residents and change your operating model for teams across all of these properties. That was a massive shift that was very challenging and took place over, um, you know, there's, there's still elements of the legacy business within what we do today, but I'd say like the full transition was probably a two year process. It's amazing how, how often the pivot has to happen within companies as they grow and have to maneuver and adapt to the market. Maybe the, the product they created isn't fitting what they thought it would serve. Uh, and the timeline it takes to actually do a pivot, it's, there's really not a playbook that we've seen. Maybe there is, but we haven't seen one where it walks you through the pivot and the timelines and the process. Uh, they're all very unique. Um, two years is a fair amount of time and investment. And, and you kind of hope you get to the end goal where it actually is proving itself out. So today, when you're out with your sales team selling, and you're at these conferences, is it to the big property owners, the, the big companies that own portfolios of real estate? Yep, that's exactly right. We're selling to those folks, um, you know, on the benefits of what we do. And then we've been thankfully doing that very successfully, scaling the numbers of, of, of properties and units that we're in across the country. And then when we do that, well, we implement the software and have all of their residents coming through the software, right? So we don't really have to pitch a consumer directly anymore. They're required to come through our software to move into their property. And then it's up to us to do a really good job um, sort of, you know, building software and creating value for them along the way in to further monetize and sort of earn some of that wallet share um, by making those purchases and those transactions really easy for them on the way in. Great. How big is the company today? You've been in business for some time now. How, what's, the, what's the company size look like? Uh, we are about 25 people uh, across the company, lean and mean. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're now in from um, sort of a customer perspective, a little over 500,000 units. And we've been in market with this product for about two, two and a half years. So uh, we've been growing here pretty quickly. How big is the market? It's huge. Um, you know, the, the multifamily market, which is frankly just... Um, our entry point here, right? So we've we focused on renters. I mean, moving is a problem for everybody. We focused on renters, uh, which is which is a big portion of the population, but also within the renter segment, we focused on multifamily properties. The reason we like renters is the frequency and the predictability of the move, right? And you have these big property management companies that are dealing with thousands of moves, and we can come in and provide value very very quickly. Uh, but even within the renter segment, you have single family rentals, which is something we're, we're starting to get into now and we have some customers around. Um, that doesn't even account for all the homeowners out there, right? Uh, of which I am one as well. And I experienced the pain after years of being a renter of buying a home and having to move into that home. The pain is still there. The task list and the different things I have to do is what's different, right? And so um, we're lucky enough to have, have built the product and our architecture, kudos to our, our great engineering team, in a way that extends itself very easily to those other use cases, the single family uh, homeowner, uh, student housing, senior housing. It's just really sort of those Lego pieces within our product that are these tasks that you have to get done. That's really what's going to defer. So um, while, you know, to your question around market size, we really focus on the multifamily renters today. We, we frankly view all, um, you know, all asset classes, anyone who's living in a, in a residential space 
as uh, ultimately our customer in the long run. You know, COVID changed how people work, oftentimes not having to go into the office anymore, but it really didn't change where we live. You have to live in a house or a, a condo or a rental. Did COVID change your business in any way? It did. Um, I think organizationally, it really allowed us to focus, right? So that was, we talked earlier about sort of the pivot and the shift within our, within our company. Um, we kind of stripped everything away and said, what's important? Where do we need to focus? Uh, and, and I think for that reason, we were really effective at building the first version of the product, getting it out there. We launched our first communities in, in uh, Q3 of 2020. So we were kind of right in the thick of it. I think there was also some really interesting trends um, that had an impact on our business. One, there was a ton of movement. People were moving like crazy in, in 2020 and 2021. Um, and that certainly was was a good thing for the business. Nobody roots for a pandemic, but uh, we, we also went fully remote, um, which has its pros and cons, but it certainly allowed us to um, recruit and attract talent from all over the country, all over the world at this point. Um, we have some folks overseas as well. We also were able to build things in pretty quickly. We have a very um, strong and agile team or, or from a product and engineering perspective where we were able to meet the demands of our new customers with things like contactless key pickup, right? So historically, you're picking up keys for your new apartment community. I'm meeting Jake at the office at 10 a.m. and Jake says, here are your keys, right? We've been, we were able to sort of leverage infrastructure in things like smart lockers and package rooms at these facilities where Jake could drop those keys in a locker and then we send Adam a code that says, hey, Adam, go pick this up within a three-day period. So I think that helped us to, um, you know, in, in just in listening to our clients and sort of understanding where things were trending, we could work quickly to, you know, deliver value and say, um, here, you know, now you can deploy this across your portfolio. Uh, and, and it's something that's really top of mind given what, what was happening, you know, in 2020. So uh, there were impacts in the business like that, but... Um, I think really the biggest thing as I reflect on it was the focus, allowing us to really strip away everything that wasn't important, all that noise, and really, really focus in on building this product and uh, getting it to market. I want to go back to something you mentioned about remote and recruiting. Um, for those out there that have had to hire uh, in, in today's world, it's a totally different world than 6, 12, 18, 24 months ago. You know, you can build a remote first company and that's been happening for a while. But, um, you know, there's some challenges to understanding, you know, your recruitment process, making sure everyone's on the same page when you're pitching who you are, what you do, the role in particular, and what that role will be doing for the company. What's been some of the insights or some of the things that have worked for you as you continue to build out your company remotely? It's challenging. I mean, I, mean, I, won't, I won't sugarcoat it. It's very challenging. I mentioned there's pros and cons. I think, you know, I think there's pros and cons to everything in this world, not to get philosophical, but the, uh, the remote culture thing is amazing. It provides incredible flexibility. It allows us to recruit from anywhere. But I think in-person time is, is really valuable. It's hard to, to build meaningful relationships. I think it comes down to shared experience, really. It comes down to being next to each other and, and you know, going through something or you know, seeing something happen in the office or going out for drinks afterwards, you lose that, right? So, so you're not necessarily going to replace that, but how do you, how do you try and, um, you know, create experiences, create culture that can substitute a little bit for it? So we've, we've placed an emphasis on, you know, where possible having, team get together, right? You always want to be protective of everybody's time, but having time dedicated where everybody's getting on, we're a small enough company where we can get on. We have an all hands meeting. We can do things like play games. We've done things like uh, Airbnb experiences where we all make tacos together. Or a member of our team had cocktail recipes she was putting together and showing everybody how to do it. Parties and things like that, right? It's not the same as, as an in-person, but I think those, you know, I certainly remember those those experiences fondly. So I think doing that and letting people know there's a community, but, you know, interpersonally that isn't just work related, right? And, and isn't just based around, hey, we have this deliverable and we have to do X, Y, Z. And then on top of that, we've we've always tried to sort of leverage conferences and personal travel to get together with our team in person. So it's something we, we really encourage um, we also have stipend for like a work from home setup and things like that. We want people to feel comfortable in their space 
Um, and then, you know, when we do have folks that are traveling or we have a conference dedicating some time before or after that event, to just like spend meaningful time together because it is rare. Um, and it's something people have, have shared with us that, uh, that they've done. Sounds really cool. Um, Adam, you, you communicate well, you seem like a good guy. What makes it great to work for your company? What makes it great to work for you? Well, I'm flattered. I don't know if everybody would agree with that, but uh, I hope they do. It makes it good to work for us. Um, you know, we have, we have a really incredible group of people. I think it always comes back to um, core values and, you know, to me, building a great culture. Um, and this is just how I think about management in general. So to your point about working for me, there's sort of three pillars to it. First is purpose, right? It's sort of like, do you believe in what we're doing? Do you believe in why we're here? The why, the mission, the vision, that is, that's a prerequisite to any good culture, any good success. Otherwise, you're just punching in, in and out, which, which is fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with, with punching in and punching out. But I think a really strong culture is grounded in purpose, almost this religion of like, wow, we believe we're making a difference here. On top, sort of layering on top of that is two other pillars, autonomy and mastery. If you're going to bring in really talented people and tell them they're really talented, you need to let them go do their thing. You cannot hover over them and say, okay, let me like, sure, there's a training and ramping period, but other, otherwise, like give them slack, let them go, let them run. Um, and I think I'm very much somebody who just lets people go run and do, and like, sure, I can reel you back if we need to, but I'd, la I'd rather you go run and fail and make a mistake. And then we can sort of pick it up from there, than try to hover over you. That's not a good use of my time. It's not a good use of your time and you're not going to be happy doing it. I think as part of that, you have the mastery component. You have the ability for people to develop and feel ownership over what they do at the company, their skill set, and their career trajectory. I think those three pillars are really important. And then sort of zeroing in on moved, we have a set of core values that spell abode, which was, you know, that's our, the, the legal entity name of the company. It's where we started before we were moved. And my favorite of them, of our, of our core values is the last one, E, which is egoless. And we have a subtext there, which is we is greater than sign me. To me, that is what is the foundation for the way I operate, the way that our, our culture is set is the collective is bigger and more important than the individual. And with that, plus those three pillars of you know, really believing in what we're doing and allowing people to go run and do and own, I think you create an environment where there's, there's safety, there's trust, there's growth, um, and people are happy and uh, stay that way, hopefully. Yeah, really well said. There's a, a, a lot to <clears throat> the culture of a company and we think a lot of it comes from the leaders. You know, how you think and how you operate, it kind of trickles down from there, but how you presented it sounds like a, a great place to be. And, you know, we interact with a hundred thousand engineers a year, whether it's through campaigns or interviews or messaging and engineers out there might hear about your company and like what they hear and they may apply direct. Who knows? You never know. Um, great. In terms of the company, where does it go from here? You've been in business now for a while. Uh, anything on the horizon that's exciting or is it just hunker down, build revenue, continue to model out what you're creating? Yeah. Um, we got some exciting things in the hopper. So, you know, I think it's a combination of we definitely have um, more than an MVP at this point. We have a very you know robust, full feature product that has product mit, product market fit is growing and we want to continue to grow that. So, so that's, you know, growing and, and selling is, is a big focus for us. Of course, my background is in product. So that's immediately sort of where my brain goes is, is what are we doing there? And where do we take things? What is that vision? You know, the way we're sort of thinking about it today is um, our portfolio of, of investments on our roadmap is, is bucketed in a couple of categories. Um, Really, the highest level buckets are continuing to do what we do really well, and that would be operational efficiency. And right now, a big focus for us is integrating more of these partnerships around helping residents with the things that they need, right? So that's, you know, purchasing things for their move, getting things set up, products and services that are relevant to this life moment, and having those be easily um, purchased in a really nice way through our product. So sort of continuing to get really good at what we do is I'd say probably 80% of what we're focused on right now. 
and we have some really exciting partnerships that we're going to be integrating into into the product soon. We'll do some press around as well that I think really differentiate us from anything else on the market. The 20% bucket is big swings, right? Like we don't want to get complacent. Cool, we found product market fit. Let's just really get you know tight on all these things that we do. It's important. Obviously, we're dedicating a lot of time to that, but we can't get complacent. We need to keep making big swings and um, you know, I think I don't want to misquote Mr. Bezos, but there was one of his shareholder letters that was something like, you know, we're still at day one and the, the moment we get to day two is, is stasis, right? Like we're, we're not going to move anywhere if we just keep doing that, that first bucket. So we have some new products in development that we're, we're testing with our clients that we're pretty excited about that aren't just the move in and the move out. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a combination of those two, the big swings and, and continuing to fine tune what we do today. Amazing journey you're on. Looks like there's a lot of growth ahead and uh, excited to kind of see how things go. It'd be great to check in, in with you down the road here. If people want to get in touch with you or find Moved, where do they go? Pretty simple, moved.com, M-O-V-E-D. Dot com and I am Adam, A-D-A-A, A-D-A-M, uh, at move.com. Adam, I guess as we wrap up here, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking some time on your Friday to spend with us and to our, all of our listeners. Thanks for spending your time with us as well. It means the world to us and uh, excited to uh, continue down this path and journey with you as well. Until the next episode, we will catch up with you then. Adam, have a great weekend. Everyone else? Talk to you soon. Thanks, Jake. Before we wrap up, I want to give a big shout out to all the entrepreneurs that have joined to make this podcast possible. And for all the listeners for listening, it means the world to me that you chose to spend your time with us today. I'm your host, Jake Aaron Villarreal, signing off for now. We can't wait to connect with you all soon on the next episode. Take care. This show is sponsored by Match Relevant, a company that helps venture-backed startups find the best people in the market, and they do it in three simple steps. First, they sit down with founders to understand their story. Second, they tell their story into multiple candidate channels. And third, they schedule interviews within 48 hours. Find us at matchrelevant.com to learn more about how we do it.